Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 10th, 2021. This is the week in charts. I'm sure I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Thank you so much. So what are we talking about? Well, current market conditions, obviously. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, hold off on your picks until we get to the charts, live charts. And once we get there, ask about them one at a time. And that's for your benefit. So what we talk about as far as our subject? Well, I want to talk a little bit about following a plan, but I also want to talk about profit centers and holy grail day hunting with leverage ETFs. And it is a bit of a holy grail hunt. And usually I like to present things that are sort of fully formed and things that I've been doing for years, but this is something that I've been studying for years and I haven't quite figured it out, but I think it's all worthwhile. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up. Stealing a line from Greg Morris, who was sitting next to me when he said this. All predictions about the future, a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. In my stock chart show that I did yesterday, I talked a little bit about following the plan, and I want to just do a quick recap on that. This is APG to the trading service. We bought it back here way back last July, and I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we'll still be in this stock this July. We're getting there. Everything was going swimmingly, and then it began to kind of implode a little bit, and it looked pretty ugly, okay? And you're thinking, Dave, you're a trend follower. Why would you still be in? Well, I've got a protective stop in place. And keep in mind that way back here, we're in swing trade mode, trying to get that swing trade profit out of it, and we did. And then we just gradually let this stop loosen up. Now, this isn't perfectly to scale, but that's about where it was during the trip up. And you can see it started to look pretty ugly, as Scooby would say, row, row. And on top of that, material construction stocks were beginning to roll over at that time, and the overall market had become iffy. Further, the Fed's printing money. Okay, how often have we heard that argument, especially lately? That means inflation is imminent and higher rates will kill the MNC stocks, material construction stocks. Now, the MNC stocks beginning to roll over, that's actually negative from a technical analysis standpoint. So you can make an argument that, hey, Dave, you're not confusing the issue with facts because that is technical analysis, right? But the plan was not to trail the stop higher and should the stock, let me rewind that, Oop. However, the plan was to trail the stop higher should the stock trend in our favor, not stay with the position as long as the MNC stocks do well and the S&P stays above a certain moving average. So we weren't trading this thinking, okay, if other stocks within the industry begin to falter and if the S&P begins to kind of get a little iffy, as it did, we're going to get out. Instead, we're saying, you know what, we're just going to let that stop take us out, good, bad, or indifferent. And as you can see, it sold off a little bit more coming dangerously close to that stop and then rallied nicely. Will they always turn around before the stop? No. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about following the plan and I got to think and right before the show, it's, it's sort of like pain management. And it's like, what kind of pain do you want and what would cause the least amount of pain? When you go into a trade, as we were discussing the Facebook group, somebody was having a hard time pulling a trigger. And it's like, okay, what is going to pay you more? Losing money on a trade or missing the mother of all trades that would have made your year or certainly made your week or month. And believe me, missing the mother of all trades is going to pay you. Other than I think yesterday, I, I, screwed up on path and then other than today i could think of like an etf i didn't make money on but other than those two trades i really can't think of of any losing trade but i could think of a shit ton of oh just demonetize sorry about that david <laughs> i can think of a shit ton of trades where i'm i've missed the boat and i had it on my radar and i had it on my screen i had it in my landry list and i didn't take it and had I taken it, even with like a thousand shares, one of them ran, I think, 200 points or so. I mean, 100 grand here, 100 grand there, it begins to add up. And believe me, that's a lot more painful. So when it comes to your pain management, 
And this is an example of you're already in the trade to begin with, and you would just be giving up open profits. I know, I know, it's still profits and it still sucks, right? But you only would have given up a little bit more of those open profits. You get knocked out, so what? And you say, thanks for all the fish. And believe me, this is not easy to do. It, it's become easier for me, one, through repetition, through years and years of doing it, two, through the trading service. This is a trading service stock, much easier for me to follow the plan for the trading service because I have to lay out a plan in the trading service. And all I have to do, as my wife tells me before we get into a lot of trouble fixing something, is follow the plan or just do this, okay? Anyway, that pain of a loss is not that great, especially if you're getting stopped out in a winning trade, okay? If you micromanaged and missed the mother of all continued opportunities, then hopefully implied, that pain is going to be much, 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 much worse. I forget how many shares we have on 100K account. I'll see the portfolio in a minute. And we could talk about how much that could be. CPE, this is our big winner from uh, last November, and hopefully we'll still be in it next November. I know you said hope. Became a little dead money for a while, nice little rally. Well, I guess we've gotten everything out of the trade. Not stopped out, what do you do? Nothing, okay? And then it went on to triple, and then went sideways, okay? What do you do? Nothing, okay? But at that point, you're thinking, Dave, that's really dead money. It's what, three months, March, April, May? Man, I'm not making any more money in this thing. I think the uh, bloom is off the rose, right? Well, follow the plan. Easier said than done. And then, of course, it takes off. <laughs> I'm not dead yet. I think I'll go for a walk. So another one of these not dead yet. Dead money reports. Okay, APG, how many shares do we have on that? Yeah, so that's 500 shares left. If it runs another 10 points, that's $5,000, okay? That's nothing to sneeze at. So that's that could be quite painful. But here's a CPE up 610%, $27,000 based on a hypothetical 1K account. Now look at the service FAQ and I'll put a link in here and I, it's not behind the firewall. So if you're not in a service, you can look at it too. Where I explain a lot of these concepts in this spreadsheet and everything else. But I do actually take these trades even though it is a quote unquote hypothetical account. ARLP, you can see it went sideways in here quite a bit. Now I was thinking this is really, really, really dead money. Now this is one that, especially in my stock chart shows, I showed over and over and over again. And I did that last summer, I think it was with AUI, or one of these gold stocks that flatlined forever. That one won a huge winner. But this thing kind of flatlined forever, built a big old base. And you had to be thinking this is really, really, really dead money. And I would imagine if one of my clients came in around somewhere around the beginning of the year, gotten this, felt pretty good, got a little money out, I'd be willing to bet they didn't hold on for the last three months. And you can see it took off once again. Now, again, they won't always do this, but the one that does on occasion versus stopping you out for a small-ish type of loss the one that takes off is going to make up for many of those smallish type of losses. Another one of those, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> so there's the RLP. Not set the world on fire, but 47%. If I did that on every trade, you'd, you'd never see my fat ass again. I'm, I'm half kidding. I'd come back and taunt you a second time. All right, let's jump into profit centers. I probably picked the wrong night to to revisit this. I, I am on schedule tonight. I will have to end the show a little bit less than an hour if, if we end up going that far. I have a, a previous engagement. I have a re rehearsal supper to go through for my cousin-in-law nephew, step-cousin-in-law, no, step-cousin-law nephew. Uh, it's going to hurt my brain if I try to figure it out. Anyway, good kid, but I'm expected to show my face. So last summer, Right around this time, maybe a little bit later, I began talking about the, the volatility hole, the rabbit hole of volatility. And I probably picked a bad night again to do it because I'm going to be a little rushed. So I'm just going to kind of gloss over a lot of these concepts. And if you can't sleep at night or if you really want to learn a lot more about volatility, go back and look at the webinar I did last summer. And you can get the, the list of the the webinars at Dave Lanardi. 
I'm sorry, at uh, Dave Landry, www.youtube slash C slash Dave Landry. That's my channel. And subscribe if you don't mind while well, you're there. But anyway, volatility can be a bit of a rabbit hole. And, and I, I went on a lot of holy grail hunting with, with volatility many years ago, just to kind of back things up a little bit. I did some work with Larry Connors many, many years ago, I guess 20 something years ago now. And Larry once said that volatility was more predictable than price. And that got me pretty excited about volatility, but volatility can end up being a rabbit hole as I'm suggesting. And the other thing is, Holy Grail Day hunting is is just that. If you could figure out when a Holy Dale Holy Grail Day is going to occur, you would own the world. Now, in case you weren't around last summer when I was doing that, that webinar, a Holy Grail Day is when a market starts at one end and it doesn't trade much above the high or the low for uptrends and ends at the other end. And, and it's also a wide range bar. I call it HG7 because it's the widest range in seven days and it starts at one end and ends at the other. And I think I used 10% as the day's range. Now this is in hindsight, these holy grails I've identified and I'll show you those in just one second. And I'll throw out a few ways of maybe knowing intraday if you're in one. But again, opens at one end, closes at the other, does it trade much higher? and closes again at the other end and on a wide range bar. Now, you can't predict these, but as I said when I did this presentation before you, there are a few things you could do to let you know if you're closing in on one. And I'm sort of channeling Crable and Larry Williams and Connors and Rasky and Natenberg and all these good people that do have done a lot of volatility research. Now, one way you know you're getting closer to that wide range bar is if volatility is dropping, and if the short term volatility especially is dropping relative to relatively to the long term volatility. Let's say you got a long term volatility of 100 on a, let's say a 50 day reading, and you're looking at a six day reading and you got a reading of 10. Okay, it's like one fifth of that 50 day reading, or even if it's just 25, it's half of that longer term reading so you're looking for a reversion to the mean move back up back toward that normal volatility now price wise you might get an inside day or you might get an inside two inside days within a relatively wide range bar means that the volatility is beginning to compress and i'll show you a few of those and then you might have a la toby crable a narrow range four narrow range seven or something crazy like a narrow range 15, the smallest range, smallest bar range in 15 bars. And the other thing that you could use for low volatility would be like a net net price change where the price is relatively unchanged. It uses a half a percent uh, program to half percent in for the scans I'm gonna show you in just one second. And then range and ATR is another good way of looking at that. And like I said, last summer at Bandcamp, when you haven't had one in a while, maybe you're due to have one. Now, I'm going to go through these pretty quick because I've already done a presentation and I'm on schedule. But a Holy Grail day, again, is when it starts within 10% of its high for the day. And obviously, this is in hindsight. and Or the low is within 10% of the low for the day. And it closes on the opposite end of the bar. So that's what a Holy Grail day looks like. Holy Grail Day 5 will be the same as a Holy Grail Day 7, except that it might be a little bit smaller range. Narrow range bar would be 4, would be the smallest range after 4 bars, 7 bars, 10 bars. And we're not looking at the average true range for this calculation, because average true range would take a new opening gap. And if we're trading intraday, we're trying to capture this holy grail day get in early in the morning and ride that dude all day long almost really demonetized samuel jackson was channeling me there for a second almost really demonetized things narrow range bar 15 would be the lowest range in 15 bars and there's an exclamation point on that one because when something gets that compressed it's due to expand and if you have a narrow range bar 
and it's an inside day, I put a little bomb there because it's, it, the market is due to explode one way or the other. Now, if you can get a wide range bar where you don't have too much chopping around one way or the other, you can still make money on that. And I'll show you a few in just one second. But you can see this gap or this stock opens here, trades that way, and then it trades this way. And I'm not sure exactly which which came first, but obviously it did trade above the open and it did trade below the low open significantly. And then an inside day is just an inside day. And if you have two inside days, I'll put a two when you have two inside days, meaning that the two days are within the bar three bars ago. And that'll make a little more sense in a minute. And again, if you can't sleep at night, I've got a longer presentation, but I just wanted to bring this up now. I think now would be a good time. Summer's going to be a little, likely a little choppy, but it's a good time, I think, to start brushing up on these concepts and know them. And then one thing I was kind of thinking, I think one reason why I'm probably thinking about this is one guy in the group was talking about doing a lot of, um, or beginning to do some some profit center trading. And, you know, I'm I'm excited about that, but it's like, okay, summer is not always the best time to start this type of, especially something that involves needing some volatility. So I, I thought it'd be a good time to brush up on the volatility. But you can see Lab D, this is, these are the historical volatilities here. We don't have ratios yet in ACP, and I'll eventually may put in a request for that. They're really busy right now, so I'm going to hold off on that. But what I like to do here is I just put in a four-day, a six-day, a 10-day, a 20-day, just a whole bunch of volatilities. And when the volatility, com volatility comes off the market, the short ones begin to implode, and then the long ones, longer-term ones begin to follow. Now. The thing is, it's a bit of a paradox. As a general statement, you don't want to be trading intraday when the volatility is dropping off. And you could see if you traded within this period of time, you probably got chewed up for the most part because there really weren't any really great days. Like this would have been a really good day back here, okay? And let's see if we got like maybe right here would have been a good holy grail day. Uh, what's the other one? Lab D would have been the one to trade on that day. But anyway, focusing back on volatility, when volatility begins to implode and gets really, really, really low, then you know the market is due to move. Now, because we are trading range intraday, or in other words, you need some range intraday, a little bar like this is just going to chew you up, okay? And by the way, if you're looking at a 15-minute bar chart, which I now use instead of five-minute bar charts. But if you're looking at a 15-minute bar chart, make sure you pop out to the daily chart to see where you are. And if you're contained within the prior day's range and just got a chopping around, don't get too caught up in the zigs and the zags. Wait for a more meaningful move. Now, again, down below, I have a 10-day average true range. Oops. And you can see that the average true range is at its lowest level of the year. So that's pretty significant. And then the, the little, I don't know what color you call that, I guess orange or amber, kind of mustardy looking line is also at its lowest level of the year. So it's a really, really compressed based on these volatility measurements. Now when volatility compresses, it's due to expand, but the paradox is when volatility is low, it might go lower or it might stay low for a while. So it's not quite as predictable as as Larry Connors might have once said. You know, as a general statement, it's somewhat predictable. You can see it's trended lower for a long time in here, but it's impossible to predict what's going to happen next. Although you know, once it gets really low and compresses, we're due for a move. So let's take a look at lab U with the indicators. I dusted these off and took a look at them. When I was trying to figure out a Holy Grail day, and here's your Holy Grail day right here, I thought of different things like I showed you already today, and I've got them illustrated on the on the charts. This is 10 days where it has less than a half a percent move. Okay, so that's compressed based on the price, and that's that's also a, a historical volatility measurements based on close only. 
But one thing I thought about is what would happen if you start looking for them when you haven't had one in a long time because you're getting closer and closer and closer to that holy grail day. And that's this indicator up here. So as soon as you have one, it goes back down to zero and the count resets. So you can see we're up here about 32 and then we we got our holy grail day and you had a few of these little indicators popping up here. And I'm gonna go through a few of those in detail in just one second. This is what it looked like on the chart, and it wasn't the easiest trade in the world because 90% of the move was on this one bar here. And then it doesn't look like it, but this little retrace was fairly significant. And I did get knocked out. I think I made money overall on this day. But, you know, the map is not the territory. You see a chart that looks like this, and you're thinking, oh, my God, I could have printed money on that day. But the reality was it was a little tougher. And I don't know if I have those trades in here. And here's the thing. And the reason I'm, I'm getting into this right now is, I don't know about you guys, but if you trade something intraday like ETFs, raise your hand if you've got like one or two big winners. But by the time you add it all up, the two or three other losers that you had for the day cancel out your entire gains for the day. So if you could just figure out how to eliminate maybe one or two of those losers, you'd have a pretty good day. I know it's holy grail hunting, believe me. But I think you have to you have to kind of noodle with it a little bit to help you get there. So take a look at Gush. This is kind of an example of something that kind of compressed and really didn't make a huge move for a while. But you can see it was a long time before we had a holy grail day. And then we had an inside day also where I think, and I relabeled these in recently, but it's an inside day. It's also the narrowest day in 15 days. We had another narrow range bar day here. And then we had a couple of days where it did okay. And that was an inside day there. And then look at these two bars. These bars were okay. And I said, you know what? Let me go in right before we went live. And it's like, let me just see what I did on that day in my most active account. And I did take some trades there. And that's one trade. And I didn't think of, I don't think I set the world on fire. I think that's like a hundred bucks or something, or 150 bucks, maybe 159. Better than the poke in the eye. And then on the next day, I traded gush, drip for down, gush for up. And looks like I lost about seven bucks. So I didn't really set the world on fire there either. And then again, the clock's still ticking, right? Because we haven't had a Holy Grail day yet. And then we finally get the Holy Grail day right there. Now, unfortunately, 90% of the move was on the first bar, as you can see here. And that's where you got to make that go or no go decision. This is the 15 minute bar. And I get asked this all the time. And I'm glad when I was putting my slides together that this, that this example came up. Because if if you were, you know, if you thought you were being prudent, I should say, and you're like, you know what, I'm not going to trade the first 15 minutes because I know there's a lot of fake outs that happen then. Well, you didn't miss 90% of the move on this trade. And if you'd have got in, gotten in a little bit later in the day, more than likely when this thing swings three or four points against you, you probably would have gotten out. But if you had four or five or six or seven or eight points of profit, you you could probably close your eyes a little bit for a little while and see if that correction doesn't take you out. And I don't think I did so hot on this day. I think I actually lost money on a Holy Grail day. And it's kind of embarrassing to show you this, but I want to show you that sometimes the map is not the territory when you're actually in the trenches. And in hindsight, looking at this, it's like late in the day I made a trade, and I think that would have I would have been slightly in the positive, but not by much. And it was a holy grail day on the daily chart, but on the intraday chart, it was tough to trade because number one, I waited for a little bit of extra confirmation more than I normally would. And like I always say, and I've got it in one of the slides further in here, but I don't think we'll pull it up tonight. But it's the the, the Mary McClellan quote, Tom McClellan's late mother, uh, paraphrasing part of that. It's some people buy them, they have money. Some people sell them, they need money. And others use far more sophisticated methods. 
And her point is that everybody uses timing. Well, part of my timing might have been like, well, I've been getting chewed up a little bit in these ETFs, so I'm going to give it a little bit more room before I get in. So that might not have anything to do with the overall market. That's just me, my personal feelings on that particular day. And as I preach, be cognizant of your personal feelings, and that's going to help you help you wrap your head around the irrational behavior of others. Your irrational behavior, if it's irrational, could be similar to others. You could be a microcosm to others is what I'm saying. So this is the current gush chart. You can see that the HV is beginning to implode in here, so we'll keep an eye on that. The range has picked up a little bit. Now, again, I haven't fully figured out how we should do this, okay? But maybe there's something like if the volatility is rising, we should consider these possible trades. You can see volatility is rising here. Nice couple of days here. This is sort of an HG day here. And this is sort of an HG day here, okay? So volatility rising, that might be a clue. Volatility shrinking, we might want to sit on our hands a little bit. Volatility getting really, really, really low, lowest level in six months or something, we might know that we're getting close to an HG day. J Doug, you can see back here, 20 something days, that's over a month without an HG day. 15 days where the net net price change today's price looking back nine days okay is less than a half a percent narrow range bar four so you know it's beginning to compress you just don't know when that wide range bar day that holy grail day is going to happen so in this case it happened a couple of days later thank you baby jesus and there's the trades now this is on account I'm pretty active with. I call it my model account because this is where I'll put all the service trades. I will put service trades in other accounts too, but this is a really active account. And if I'm gonna do like the profit centers, this is where I'll do them. And I will, I'll do them across multiple accounts. I'll just try not to be as active as I am in this account. So I just pulled it up and I only bought a hundred shares and you don't need a lot because the problem is when you start losing you can lose a lot of money pretty quick. And so let's say you lost $459. Well, that's it's like $112,000 a year if you did that every day. So if you made that every day, that's an extra $112,000, which isn't bad based on this account size. So this is what it looks like. This is the, I uh, just wanna show you real quick. Here, this is where we are with the S&P 500. You could see last time we went above, it went 50 days with an HG day, 51, 52 or so. And then we had this HG day here. It wasn't incredible, but if you could have somehow stayed out of the market and traded just on that day, you probably made a lot of money. And then the next day was a wide range bar down, almost an HG day. You done pretty good there. And then the, the, the next day, I'll have to look at these three days and see how I did. I seem to remember there was a week where I was on fire where I was long one day and short the next and long the other and doing fantastic. And I'll go in and look at those in post. Anyway, so where are we now? Well, you can see I got pretty compressed here. We had an okay day here, we had HG five days. So we did get a nice little opening gap reversal. I'll hope, I don't know what I did on this day. I'll have to go in and look, but I hope I was able to capture that because it was an opening gap at all time highs or close to all time highs and then coming back in. So you had that opening gap reversal and not the last week at band camp, but if you go in and look at the presentation I did last summer, and I'll see if I can put a link in there here in post, you'll see that I, I talked about possible patterns that you might want to trade when that HG seven day is near or imminent, okay? And it might be something like an opening gap reversal from new highs, if a market is super oversold, you might be looking for a bounce back with that expansion of volatility. Here's the S&P 500. You can see it's beginning to, well, this is actually an old one, so ignore, is that right? No, it's right. So 
you can see that the volatility has begun to implode. And as the market kind of gradually makes new highs, it will begin to implode. And again, you know, just kind of looking at these as I'm doing them. So as volatility is coming down, maybe you don't want to be doing that intraday trade. As volatility begins to rise and everything's fairly low, then you might want to start looking for an intraday trade to try to capture that wide range bar. The problem here, problem is I'm here every day looking at it and I may get sucked in a little bit to the flickering ticks as I think that comes from Todd Harrison. I got it from David Keller and he got it from Todd Harrison. But anyway, you can see volatility has begun to implode in the S&P. So we'll keep an eye on what's happening there and see what happens. I know I went through a lot real quick, but I just kind of want to show you some of the research I'm kind of getting back into. It's like whenever I get a chance, I always find myself gravitating back to this, this type of stuff. The the momentum stuff comes from going through 2,000 charts every day and seeing reoccurring patterns. And then when I'm doing something like a profit center or whatever, I'm like, how do I improve this? And lately getting chewed up a little bit, I've found myself taking a step back because like I said, I'll have one that'll be up nicely. Let's say I'm up a grand or something in one of these, caught quite a few points, but then I'm getting chewed up 300, 300, 300, 300 and all the others and I end up losing for the day. Well, that doesn't do anyone any good other than I can say, show you that, hey, look, I caught this holy grail day, but you know, what else did you do that day, Dave? <laughs> anyway, if you want to see the stocks that I mentioned here directly, other than like the profit center stuff, all the service stocks I just showed earlier, you can, you can find those. If you're on the trading service, you can find them down below the service. If you're not, and this is not firewalled, and I'll update them to get them fairly current, okay? So those who are on the service could check them out. Good, bad, and indifferent, warts and all. I do have a members area. I think everyone here is in a, mem a member live, but if you're if you're not a member, it's 47 bucks a month, and we have a good group, and we get together and hang out in the Facebook group. I learn a lot from the group, and I get a lot of stock, great stock picks from the group. And uh, I'm very humbled by some of the skills of the people in the group. So it's 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 really cheap and worth your while. I hate to soft sell you, but it's it's pretty awesome. All right, I'm going to hop into the charts real quick. You guys want to talk about some individual, uh, ask about some individual stocks? Do so now. And uh, if you don't mind, get them in quickly, just because I'm on schedule tonight. And what I'd like to do, uh, what I will do, I should say, is I'm going to hop into the charts first. And we'll take a look at the we'll take a look at the what what's going on here? We'll take a look at the the indices and just get a quick thumbnail of what I'm seeing in the markets. And then we'll get to your stocks. Okay. Okay, SP 500. First thing that I see here I've been looking at lately is net net price really hadn't gone anywhere in a little while. Oh, let me make sure you guys are seeing this first. Okay, SP 500. As you can see, it hasn't gone anywhere for a while. Up uh, for all intents and purposes, pretty much flat for over a month. Okay, yeah, there was some zigs and zags. Might have caught some intraday stuff on that, but last few weeks have been just kind of chopping around in here. But today we did manage to close at all-time highs, and all-time highs is all-time highs. I'm not going to argue with all-time highs. Notice that the bow ties, 10 simples greater than 20 exponential, 20 exponentials greater than 30 exponential. That suggests we are in an uptrend. Nothing magical about that, but it can, as I preach, help to keep you on the right side of the market. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. Not a bad day today, okay? Bow ties back in uptrend proper water. We do have to get past these prior peaks in here for me to get excited about the market. Rusty, a little bit different story. I like to use a coffee cup. You know, all the coffee cups were dirty, the white ones, so I ended up with my honey badger don't care <laughs> cup. So nice. Look at this market. <laughs> I started to do a market in a minute like that once in my honey badger voice, in the honey badger voice, but 
I decided to nix it. Take a look at uh, the Rusty. Rusty got hit pretty hard today, so this scores is a bit of a bummer. I know that we got hit fairly hard. We did have a short DHI that worked out okay. We'll take a look at that real quick. So that worked out nicely for us today, but for the most part, we kind of got hit a little bit. It always is, I always hate it from my educational business standpoint when the market makes an all-time high and the portfolio gets hit a little bit. And that's just trading momentum. And I don't want to fear monger too much, but sometimes what happens if you've got a lot, a lot of momentum stocks, like when I used to track a portfolio of 100 of them, that thing would get creamed like three and four percent. We didn't get creamed that hard today, so I'm not too worried. But that thing would get creamed three or four percent, even though the market would be making new highs, and then the market would sell off hard. It was a bit of a, a harbinger, if that's the correct correct word to use. But that's another story. And one day I need to get back into that. I need a staff. I really do. I just don't want to deal with people. <laughs> that's why I got into trading, I guess. Uh, I want to have fun with people. I don't want to tell people what to do. I want to go out and drink a beer or something. Okay, Russell 2000. We still got to get past this peak in here. Somebody was talking about head and shoulders in a group the other day. And yeah, this was a pretty good looking head and shoulders. But as I said, you really can't time off of something like a big picture pattern like head and shoulders because it might take forever for it to form. And then, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and months. And it's the mother of all head and shoulders and the rusty. And it was the market do. It went up to make a double top. Okay, well, Dave, can you trade off a double top? Well, maybe, but that's another one of those big picture patterns that might take a long term, long time to unfold. And also it might unfold in a strange way, like it might blast past the prior peak and then implode. It's gonna do something to fake people out. So you gotta be really careful that big picture stuff, learn it all, but then learn how to use it sort of a sort of sort of sort of as a backstop to your methodology. So if you get a bow tie after a triple top or head and shoulders top or something, then by all means you might have a top in place. Let's take a look at gold, the commodity. Not a bad day today, a little choppy recently. But as you can see, it's trying to get this act together. It's trending higher. Energy is just off of all-time highs. So far, so good there, but they are drifting a little bit in here. I do like, I'd like to see some acceleration. I don't like upward drift. I don't mind downward drift. In fact, that's a good thing, downward drift, kind of like a little flag pattern. Upward drift, they call that a bit of a wedge. That does concern me a little bit, but at the end of the day, we're right at or right below all-time highs, so I'm not going to get too worried right away. Metals and mining kind of correcting it here, but longer term, still in an uptrend, still looking pretty good. Real estate, brand new highs today. Take a look at drugs. Drugs have been on fire. Look at that accelerating higher. I sound like a little tiny Elvis coming out here. And not that long ago, it was a little bit bearish on, look, you had a nice little bow tie here. You had a nice little sell off out of the bow tie. And this is a problem with the short side. It just looks like it's gonna implode. Looks like you're gonna get rich and then turns right back around. Biotech, none of those areas that just look like it was left for dead, but look at that, coming back nicely in here. M&C stocks, not so much. I just showed you that home builder, DHI. I'm also short. Pulte, which I think is PHM. I haven't looked at that one today yet, or after hours, I think. But you see it had a nice little move lower. This was also in a Landry list recently. Landry list is my call list and the actual official recommendations or the ones that I often show in the these presentations themselves. Anyway, back to MNC overall. MNC overall, not looking so hot in here. I don't think I have a, um, a, a chart of lumber on the fly. I posted to my personal Facebook account that lumber futures are down. I thought it was down 60%. I did the math in my head and I didn't realize I was doing backwards math, but. It, it, lumber futures for September went from 1,600 to 1,000 round numbers. And I'm like, wow, that's a 60% drop. And that happened since May 10th. And like I said, a while back, we we're building something. And one of the wood guys was like, well, lumber prices are going up forever. And I'm like, channeling Caddyshack. No, they don't, Danny, knowing that. That was probably close to the peak in here when he said that. In fact, the timing looks 
pretty close to like this peak here. This is wood. These are these are timber companies, but it does give you kind of an idea. You can see they have begun to implode. It's all supply and demand. And then the speculators, I don't want to say anything bad about the speculators because I'm a speculator, but speculators might push that market a little bit further, create a little more panic than is really there, maybe a little false uh, demand. But they run for cover really quick when things begin to go sour, and that helps to bring the market back down quickly. So that's wood, which is forestry companies. Transports have lost a little steam in here. Look, we're down below 30 EMA, not the end of the world, still on a longer term uptrend, but losing a little steam. So we'll pay attention to what's happening there. Software, on the other hand, just at all time highs. I'd like to see a bus past this prior peak and not look back but certainly improving in here. Semiconductors, not a bad day today. We still gotta get past these multiple tops in here. As I often say, I'm much more concerned about the semiconductors confirming what's going on in the overall market than the transports. And some people say it's kind of like the electronic superhighway or the, or the data is being transmitted electronically as opposed to the shipping. But it seems like shipping or well, the transportation, I should, I should say in general, it's still fairly significant and it's still pretty good uh, gauge of the economy. I mean, how many brown boxes with little smiles on do you have on your front porch right now, okay? Outside day up in bonds. The whole world is telling me that rates are going up and I guess they don't have charts, okay? <laughs> bonds up, rates down, okay? So, we should be over here somewhere in this downtrend, but so far we've bottomed out in bonds. I'm not gonna rush out and buy bonds, but it sure looks like they bottomed out for now. Ultimately and longer term, yeah, take a look at the weekly chart, they're probably in a little bit of trouble. But over the short haul, and this is why you can't put too many themes together. They're printing money. Yeah, they're printing money, but <laughs> the, uh, the, bond, the bond market is a honey badger market. It doesn't care. All right, let's take a look at some of your stocks. And then I'll have to get out of here before I get in trouble. I'd rather be here. Oh, did I say that? Shit. <laughs> Just kidding, no, I'm not. I'm half kidding. How's that? All right, let's take a look at Root. Root for a bow tie. I saw this one or one like it. My only concern with some of the bow ties I'm seeing is you do have some trading back here to contend with. And anybody who's trapped in this stock might be looking to get out of break even. It's not horrible. And it's good that some of the possible supply is behind this trend down here. My one concern though is that your whole trend is just two bar, just these two bars blasting higher. I would say it's okay but I wouldn't personally rush out and trade it just because it just had this, sometimes they get a little too far ahead of themselves when they have such a blast higher. <laughs> Congratulations on marriage, Dave. It's Marcy on the market now. No, it's my, my, what is he? I, yeah, it hurts my brain. He's my uh, uncle in laws son. He's a good kid though. He is a good kid. Take a look at lack. Um, well, you're looking for some sort of reversal, I'm guessing. And with a transitional pattern, I prefer a transitional pattern like way back here, kind of like the one we just looked at. And this thing's at kind of mid levels. I think it looks okay. I wouldn't personally go in and take a position trade in this. But I will tell you this, as I said earlier, through the empirical research, it seems like in more recent times, we've been, we've been talking about this return to paradise pattern where a stock shoots up, implodes, gets its act together and takes off again. So if I didn't have all this chart back here to see that we're kind of at mid levels, I'd be a little more excited about it. But I have to say, and I'll have to give you a high five because 
it is a nice looking bow tie. And unlike the last one, it just kind of went straight up. It's kind of worked its way higher and then pulled back. So this looks pretty good. I probably look for too much perfection sometimes in the charts. And I just would prefer a bow tie like coming off of really low levels like this as opposed to mid levels up here. But I think it looks, I think it looks okay. Okay. Are you talking about a position trade in this one? Is that Opti Gab? Oh, you're talking about my glasses. <laughs> uh, readingglasses.com, I think. Okay, we looked at Root. Did we look at Root? Yeah. Now, this looks pretty good. Um, who brought this up? HTSN. John, of course it's John. Good job, John. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Yeah, good volume. Yeah, this is okay. I mean, it's a little wide and loose, but it looks like it's kind of gotten its act together as of late, okay? It's got a few wide range bars, which in this case is pretty good because it did follow through to the upside. Usually I prefer, if you take these bars here and move them over here and move this wide range bar or two over here, in other words, more acceleration as opposed to maybe a little less acceleration here and then more on this side, I'd like it better. I would let it pull back a little bit more than it's pulled back, ideally, because you did have this sharp run up here. I'd like to see that corrected a little bit more, shake out a few more people, okay? Remember, everything we do with technical analysis is reading the emotions of the market, and while at the same time embracing our own. Hello, Carol, how have you been? Haven't seen you in a while, glad to have you. Yeah, this looks pretty good, except it's super duper duper thin and you can get hurt really bad, especially in IPOs when they're thin. I would wait for a pullback and then reconsider and then there's not enough time tonight, but go through these bar by bar and see if it has plenty of, plenty of high volume days, okay? And just might be resting now. But yeah, maybe put that on your momentum list. Probably too thin to trade. TMCI. This one does have a little bit more. This one's kind of funky looking. But I hear you. And let's put in a five-day moving average. It's a little on the thin side, so be a little careful. If you were playing some sort of buy at B type of pattern, meaning that you're buying new highs because it's a little higher priced, make sure you have Landry Light with the five day SMA, okay? And, um, oops. And based on that pattern, this would have been an entry here, but it's a little funky for me. Just kind of wide and loose, and the range isn't phenomenal for an IPO, but yeah, worth keeping on a watch list for sure. OTLY, Carol, you're all over these IPOs, aren't you? Yeah, this one looks a little better. You've got a decent range, you've got decent trends. So yeah, I want to pull back. Absolutely. Good job, Carol. But you need to pull back now. Lack, did we talk about that one? I think we did. Oops. Yeah, we talked about that one. Great looking over the short term, a little bit longer term, have a couple of concerns. No. You know the stock? Okay. I pay attention inside days. ACMR is a recent example. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So what what John Z is saying is you got an inside day, and then you got an inside day, and then you got an inside day, okay? It's kind of like the Russian dolls of inside days. All three are contained within this one right wide range bar, and he's looking for a pop out. Yeah, I hear you. Good job, and that's a good... Uh, that's something we probably should be watching. Sure. VEI is a double inside and looks good above 15.54. Well, I hear you. In my case, though, I'd prefer if it would pull back. And so what John's doing, he's doing some of that uh, Toby Crable stuff. You got an inside day of an inside day, and he's thinking that it's going to expand. But what I would do is I would I think I'd wait for this to pull back and then look to get uh, look to take off. Yeah, volatility contraction exactly. Yeah, contraction and then usually usually you get some expansion. Toby, uh, John, I think you read Toby's book, haven't you? 
um, I don't, I think I have a copy here. I think it's like $3,000. I read it from a library, I believe, when I was first getting started. And John Z, you've got it. Okay, good. But yeah, a lot of Toby Crable stuff. AVAH, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. That's a good looking IPO. And buy it B, you would have been long on on that day there. You would you would have just gotten long on a pullback, or if you missed the buy it B, throw in that five day simple and then look for a little landry light above. You might have a little here. But if you get a little landry light and a new closing high, you want to see some acceleration. Now, keep in mind, to those who are just kind of newer to my methodology, IPOs are traded a little bit differently than the core methodology, at least when you're getting started. But like ASO, which was uh, one of our big IPOs this year that we did well with, are we still in it, too? And uh, like that was a secondary setup, a pullback, just like the core methodology. But early in the IPO process, and sometimes not so early, there are a few patterns we look for that is that are more uh, breakout in nature. And we're actually kind of the old um, Will Rogers quote plays out. We're buying things that go up. And if they don't go up, we don't buy them. Alf, um, not yet for me. To me, it just took off and came back in. I've had bad luck with low price IPOs. And maybe you guys can let me know if you had a similar experience and but there's one recently and it might be the otly that you also brought up jeff that's that i passed on but yeah let this thing get going okay or let it bottom out for a while then play a bow tie and the one that the one that comes to mind was ghvi and we're long this one now um cash in your kids college fund put everything into it okay and it, double your margin <laughs> kidding you can see a nice little bow tie. You know, they, sometimes they fly, they die, and then they fly again. They get their act together, they bottom out a little bit. And that's what happened with the GHVI, and that's why I like that one. Uh, it has triggered now, but so maybe that one will do that. OTLY, I want that's the one that I missed. Yeah, no, that's not it. That's not it. Yeah, on a pullback, okay. It looks pretty good. I think the buy B, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. The range wasn't here. This is why I didn't take the buy at B. Didn't have enough range for me to get excited about that. But yeah, good eye. Keep that on your watch list. AVAH. I think we talked about that one. That one looks good on a pullback, maybe. Either that or, yeah, we just talked about that one. Waits for some acceleration higher. All right, last one, and I'm going to have to bail before I get in trouble. Again, I'd rather hang out with you guys. Okay, uh, so George or David. George is thinking about doing this as a profit center trade. Um, I think it would pass just because it's kind of wide and loose. I would look for more perfection and in the trades. And the Landry list has been really small lately, and that's just because the market's been a little choppy, okay? So maybe hold off on that one. Maybe do a little paper trading with it, George. I know you're just kind of dipping your toe in the water on these Russian dolls and these little patterns inside of patterns. Uh, just kind of tread lightly for a little while. And this was a little wide and loose. Look for a little bit more perfection in it. Well, look, guys, I got to run. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Any, any unanswered questions, bring them up Facebook. I'll, I'll put some charts together. We'll talk about it there. If you're not a member of DaveLander.com, then become a member. What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> Math kidding. Anyway, everybody have a great weekend. If we don't talk between now and then, thank you so much. Please like this video, comment. Even if you don't like it, comment. And if you don't like it, instead of liking it, go have not liking it, go have no fun somewhere else. All right, everybody have a great night and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you all so much and may the trend be with you.